The Bristol Flyers podcast is proudly sponsored by UE Bristol, who are running both on-campus and virtual open days during November. So if you're considering your uni options at the moment, you can explore their campuses in person or online. Just search open days at UE Bristol to find out more. This is the Bristol Flyers podcast. Hello and welcome back to a brand new season of the Bristol Flyers podcast with me, your host, Joel Osborne. We are back for season two. And this episode, we speak to Flyers head coach Andreas Kapoulis and assistant coach Nick Burns. And this year, we also welcome a brand new co-host in my good friend, Sam Hardy. Sam, welcome to the Bristol Flyers podcast, mate. Hey, Joel. Thanks for having me, mate. I'm really excited to be involved. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a good season, I feel, already. I mean, we're obviously recording this intro after Saturday's season opener against um, the Cheshire... I was going to say Surrey Scorchers then, Cheshire Phoenix <laughs> on Saturday. Um, and it's, uh, it's it's good to like finally relaunch the podcast again this year and to have you on board as well as um, your, like our co-host slash producer slash editor right yeah and and i'm you know i'm really looking forward to getting involved with what we're doing and um, we must quickly say though that we recorded the episode um before the weekend's game against uh, cheshire so some of the references might be a tiny bit outdated but uh but that's all right isn't it yeah that's absolutely fine i, th- I feel like you know everything they're saying in the interview they made some really good points and, you know, this episode previews the whole the season as a whole. So, you know, um, it's almost like Inception where we know what's happened right now, but later in the episode, we don't know what's happened. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, the podcast Inception for you. There we go. Um, I've got to give a massive <laughs> shout out to you anyway for, for being with us this year and helping us out because um, I, I, f- I feel like we weren't as consistent last year as I wanted to be with our podcast. And um, it's a really good, it's a really good chance to hear from the players and stuff as well. So um, I feel like this year having you with us can hopefully, I don't want to put like a number on it, but hopefully can help us get some more episodes out this year. Well, I've been involved for a little while now as well, um, you know, doing the announcing at the game day and stuff. But there's so many people that I've not really met around uh, the scenes of the Flyers. And I'm looking forward to interview some of them, learn about what's going on uh, underneath the, or behind the scenes, I should say. And uh, yeah, and I, I imagine the fans are looking forward to that as well. Yeah, I think so. Um, just to go through the format for this this season's podcast, obviously a huge part of it will be the guest segment. Uh, so we're looking to have some great guests on from around the club on each episode this season. And then on top of that and going into their stories, Sam and I are going to round up the latest BBL news, what's going on around the league. And hopefully I can give you a bit of insight into what happens day to day with the Flyers media team as well. We can let you know what what we've been up to behind the scenes. And, um, you know, Sam, like you said, I mean, you're new to the show, but like you say, you do the PA announcing. People are very familiar with your voice already but for those that don't necessarily know you just tell us a bit about yourself and and your background as well well they're gonna get bored of my voice gonna be on here and on the uh, on game day as well but uh so i've been playing basketball since i was about four years old uh went to uni here in bristol I actually went to uni with joel and uh with steve who some of you might not know but he does loads he's really involved with what's going on with the flyers and uh, we played together didn't we back in the day joel we did back then back way back then uh, i don't think i picked my basketball <laughs> seriously now for Oh, nearly a good eight to ten years now. I don't think not 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 properly anyway. But you know, we used to we used to both be uh, both to be both be uh, pretty decent hoopers back in the day. <laughs> you say it like that, no one's gonna believe us with really, language like that. <laughs> uh, but- but yeah, I've been doing uh, been doing the announcing for a few years now. Absolutely love everything going on with the Flyers. Uh, big old fan as well as as well as being involved. So yeah, mate, really excited to be uh, to be involved with the podcast now as well. Thanks for having me. It's all good. Well, before we um, get into our interview with Coach and uh, Coach K and Coach Burns, we have to start by talking about Saturday's game against Cheshire Phoenix Flyers. They came out on top, seventy six points to sixty eight um, against the Knicks at home. Sam, what did you make of it? Because although you know the Flyers came away with a win the first half the offense both offenses were really struggling weren't they oh my goodness I can't what was the first score there's something like 13-11 in the first quarter I might be wrong on that yeah it was low and you know neither team really went on a run I think Cheshire led by as many as eight Flyers led by as many as seven but not either team could really grab hold of the momentum really until the the second half and then Malcolm Delpesh just came out all guns blazing in that third quarter, didn't he? He hit everything. He was 
It was really good to see, actually. It was funny because his twin brother, who he had before, Mal- uh, Marcus, was watching watching the game, wasn't he? Yeah, so Marcus was there, Dana Dozy was there, and Panos Mayan Dombe, uh, and Chris Taylor as well. So for- plenty of former Flyers players in the house and uh, plenty of former Flyers players on the other team as well. Of course, Teddy O, Ben Mockford, who... Um, First chance for them to see the Flyers fans in person, obviously playing behind closed doors last year. And um, Levi Bradley, of course, big fan favourite from that cup final uh, team in 2020 as well. So obviously I had a chance to speak with all of those guys before tip off. Just good to see them again, uh, see them all back in the league for another year and you know just get back to some kind of normality, which is fantastic. Well, and you know they're good guys. Like Dan was there at the end of the game, going and speaking to all the uh, all the regular fans, and, and and it was so nice to see. But I was going to say as well, like we saw how athletic Marcus was all those years, but like this year or, or this game, I should say, Malcolm turned it on and was like he hit some great. He hit a couple of huge dunks, didn't he? One alley oop play, which was so nice, wasn't it? Yeah, and I think. Um... I think they did a really good job of uh, going at Ocherobi as well in that first half. I think he had like two fouls in the first quarter straight away. And Mike Ocherobi is one of those players that always heats up against us at the Wise Campus. I mean, he's had, he's had monster games for for Surrey and for Cheshire and for Plymouth in the past as well. So um, I think he uh, he left the game early with like two two fouls. He picked up his third at the start of the second. And then, um, you know, that just opened it up for, for Malcolm to really do his thing, which is awesome. So I think he, uh, what was it 26.6 rebounds he finished with and um yeah a really big win at home against uh cheshire which i imagine will probably be a, a playoff rival this year uh for flyers so you know always good to get one of them on the board early on and going into the season you know well one and oh that is that is a dream start for us isn't it yeah it's fantastic and obviously now they've got the break they got um uh what is it cup uh quarterfinal ne- uh, this weekend up in glasgow and then uh, we've got Gla- uh, three trips to Glasgow coming up now in the next month, three trips before Christmas, which, uh, you know, thank God we're flying to all of them because they are <laughs> long days. I think one of them we stay overnight, two of them we're there and back on the day. As long as EasyJet don't delay their flights home, we should be home by midnight on both of those days. So um, not too bad at all. Um, and Sadly, yeah. though, we've only got two more home games this side of Christmas, don't don't we? And they're both on the same weekend, the 3rd and the 5th of December. Uh, I'm not sure at this point when it goes out if tickets will still be on sale, but you must grab, grab them quick because they will go, won't they, No, Joel? they are. They, they, yeah, they, they are on sale right now. We're doing a massive push over the next two weeks for tickets on both of those games. A rare Sunday afternoon game as well at SGS. Uh, goes down really well with the school kids. I think tip-off's 3 o'clock on that one, so... Um, you know, you can get home nice and early before school on Monday. Um, but, you know, having a Sunday game is pretty, uh, be quite a strange experience. But, you know, some good, I remember some good games we've had on Sundays in the past, and most notably that playoff game 2018, I think it was against Newcastle, that second leg. Right, let's get to our interview with Coach K and Coach Burns. As as uh, Sam said, this one was recorded before the Cheshire game. Um, lots of great points covered here, talking about the season ahead. And um, uh, let's get to it. Here it is. Here's episode one of season two of the Bristol Flyers podcast with Andreas Kapoulos and Nick Burns. You're listening to the Bristol Flyers podcast. Okay, welcome back to the Bristol Flyers podcast. And joining us now is Flyers head coach Andreas Kapoulos and assistant coach Nick Burns. Guys, welcome back to the podcast. All right, morning all. Morning all. Thank you for having us. If It, it does feel, uh, I can't believe it's been a year since we did this last year it's gone so quickly isn't it with all the whole like the whole pandemic and everything going on and i'm still sat here in front of my bookcase talking to the world <laughs> yeah <laughs> obviously uh lots of new things into the team this year as well obviously we got uh sam with us now as our uh flyers podcast co-host how you doing very well we're all very good um and, and sort of plenty of stuff to catch up on um I, I'm, I'm just aware we haven't really done much conversation around you know, usually we do this massive preseason chat at the start of the year. We'll get some preseason content out, and obviously the the cup games have almost been like a bit of a preseason. So, you know, at the time of recording, we're heading into the start of the regular season this weekend. I thought it'd be a good chance to, you know, just talk about some uh, so, so a lot of things that you know um, have changed over the summer. A lot of new things into the team this year, and, and just to preview the the start of the season. To be honest with you, I know Andreas. Um, there is one thing I do need to cover before we actually get started. I know you were on the BBL show the other week and um, you were doing really well up until the last question when they asked you um, who would play yourself in a movie. <laughs> and 
And and you and you said Tom Hardy. Uh, I stand by it. <laughs> you got to stand by it. Uh, I mean, how it happened is I was asked the question, and the only actor that came to my mind at that point, I had a, like a poster of uh, a Batman poster, so I thought Bane immediately. I was like, who was playing Bane? I was like, Tom Hardy. Let's go with Tom Hardy. So that's how it happened. That's the behind the scenes, how, how the decision making process happened. But since then, I've heard a few things. Uh, you know, my wife said George Clooney. Uh, obviously, she's biased. So. Uh, you know, and then I had Adam Sandler for some of the players as well. So, uh, uh, you know, but I'll, I'll stick by my original decision. Nick has not commented on it yet. So uh, I'm going with Tom Hardy still. <laughs> I think Ursula said George Clooney because she was after a present or something. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, Nick, who would play you in a movie about your life? Oh, God. I don't know. If you're one of those old. So it's wouldn't it like Albert Finney or Ian McKellen at the moment? I don't know. I do think actually, when I, a few years ago, I reckon Andy Garcia might have been a good one actually. But there you go. That's probably wishful thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I will go with Robert De Niro. I reckon. There we go. That's the one. That's the perfect. One. I guess let's just sort of dive straight in and just sort of crack on with some of the the, the new things in the, the the team this year. Obviously, the the main talking point. I think a lot of fans will have noticed through the season is obviously the 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 brand new squad this year only two guys retained from last year's team just just talk us through the process of 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 what made you want to do that that shake up over the summer and and you know go with a fresh bunch of faces for this season well i mean last season um i mean it was a difficult year it was a difficult year for all of us uh playing with our fans uh was very uh, tricky um and you know, in terms of our performances, we had some very good performances. Um, but but I think the main thing from it is with, I mean, we had a couple of isolation periods uh, that we had to deal with. And and just really playing with our spectators was very difficult for the team. And it was one of those seasons where our home record was uh, severely worse than our away record, actually. And um, like the fans for, for us have always been uh, a big factor of our success. Uh, coming into the summer, uh, you know, every few years you feel like it's time to change up the roster a little bit, uh, have some more new faces, and we felt it was that time of of the of of the period for us, if you want to call it that. Um, retaining Josh and Raf uh, was was huge for us um, from a leadership standpoint, but also in terms of the qualities that they bring on the court. Um, and what we wanted is we wanted uh, a younger group, uh, more length. There were certain attributes that we're looking from a basketball perspective. Athleticism and length were uh, two uh, very important for us. Um, and, and, and some of it was also a decision around budget as well. I mean, you know, we've got to be realistic. Is you, you know, you have what you would like the roster to look like. And it's also uh, some of the restrictions that you've got to work around. Um, we're very excited about the group that we have put together. Um, and I think the performances in the, in this cup uh, group stages have been very uh, positive. Um, and you can really see the team improving every game. And if you take away maybe the, the first half of that London game at home, I think uh, in every other kind of spells of games that we've been, uh, we've been very competitive. Um, but in terms of the process, it was just... Uh, Myself speaking with 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 our coaching staff, with Nick and and Chris, and just kind of talking about the style of play, how we wanted to uh, to have our team playing this year, and uh, and also some of the natural changes that you have. You know, you had guys that have been with us for a significant amount of of years, um, and we just needed a fresh look, and and also for them probably a change uh, of. Uh, it's just a fresh kind of look on things, basically. So I think that was kind of important. And that was a lot part of the process in terms of putting together this year's roster. Some That's really interesting. Some things I want to know are things like, how early do you start looking for your new players in the, uh, in the next year? And uh, follow on from that, um, how do you go about looking for your American players? What's the sort of process of that? Well, it's a very good question. I mean... I mean, Nick smiled at the same time I smiled. So, I mean, uh, we don't switch off a lot. So I think <laughs> as soon as the season finishes, a lot of people think probably, you know, we go away on a, a little bit of holiday. I mean, this this year you could not go on holiday. As straight, it wasn't as straightforward anyway. Um, 
it happens very quickly, actually. You know, the, the season finishes and, and you need a little bit of time to, you know, settle down and, and, and relax a little bit. But in terms of looking for new players, that happens fairly quickly. Uh, and you already start thinking and planning about next year's team. Um, and certainly I bombard Nick with loads of emails that we get from agents and that process starts uh, and gets going. Uh, so, so it is an ongoing process, really. Even during the season, you know, we're thinking, okay, what's working well for us and what we would like maybe perhaps to improve for next year. Um, but as soon as our season comes to an end, um, the focus is really on preparing next year's team. And in terms of the American players, um, it, it, it changes uh, from year to year in terms of the style of play that we want to play. Uh, budget has a part of this to play as well uh, in terms of who could kind of we can retain, but also some uh, players uh, that we want to give the opportunity to play here at our program. Um, and in terms of our American players, I mean, um, obviously the level of skill is very important um, uh, for the players. And, and you can see that in some of the guys that we've uh, brought in this year. Um, and then a lot of, a lot of factors that you look in. Uh, character is very important. Um, and, and, you know, the, the next thing after that is, um, you know, the, the attributes that we're looking in terms of our team. So if it's, you know, athleticism, if it's length, uh, the positions, the particular positions that we need to, to fill. Um, but I think the, the main thing is we're looking for skill guys, and, and high character guys. And, um, and then the rest falls into place there. And there's a lot of back and forth with myself, Nick and Chris uh, to try to, to find the right pieces of the puzzle, if you want to call it. Nick, how are you finding it now that you're retired from teaching? Have you got more time to spend on the BBL program or are you just enjoying some of that extra time yeah. off? Or No, it means, <clears throat> it means I can go up during the day, obviously. Um, which wasn't possible before. I could only do the evening practices, the Tuesdays, Thursdays. I was always lucky I could get away for most Friday games. Um, but now I can um, go up during the week. If I want, I'll usually take a, <laughs> take a day off um, somewhere. So I'm not going up every day, but it's, uh, uh, it's a lot easier to get up there, certainly. Yeah. Just, I actually just want to put, uh, just add a little bit to uh, Sam's original question about when the process starts. One of the other things that makes it difficult at the end of the previous season is you've got to try and work out who's likely to stay and who's likely to go because you can't mm -hmm. ask them until the season's over. Um, you know, you can't really be talking to people about contracts for next year when you're going into the playoffs in just case you want to say we don't want to give you any money, you know. So you're always thinking, well, will they stay, will they go? And, and, and that's so you're thinking about it even though you, you don't want to be in the last sort of six weeks of the previous season who you want to keep in. So there's all sorts of complications there because you don't know who's going to stay and who's going to go. So as fans, we obviously get to see you guys at work on game day. We enjoy watching like a really animated Andreas on the sidelines and we, we see your conversations from a distance. But I had the privilege of traveling with you lot to a uh, an away game recently. And I love getting to see the way you as a coaching team sort of work well together behind the scenes. And it's, you know, it's clearly a huge team effort in terms of decision making. And the way you coach the team, <clears throat> how does that teamwork work during the off season when you're picking players and all the rest of it? Uh, do you end up having sort of any arguments about that? You know that sort of thing. I think the um, the thing about the, the 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 get the games and what goes on in the games is is absolutely that you don't see the preparation, even if you're thinking about um, or not thinking about preseason, just what goes into a game. Um, I mean, we've got Cheshire coming up on Saturday, and people will. Doubtless, see, it's going. It's Cheshire. It's going to be one of those close games. It's probably going to go to overtime, you know. Um, but <laughs> you'll see Andreas jumping up and down and, and being his usual self on the sidelines. But all the work for that has gone in. It's going in at the moment. He's put already put hours into looking at the looking at them, working out a game plan, um, doing the scout report for players, and we're working on it in training this week. So it's kind of like what you see in the game. It's all the prep for that's all been done really beforehand. Um, it's a bit like the teaching analogy I would use. It's like if you're going to teach a really difficult lesson, you know, with a difficult group and you've got to teach an awkward topic. You know, if you put the prep in beforehand, it's going to, it's going to be OK on the night sort of thing. Even if things go wrong, you're kind of ready for it. Um, and so what you don't see is all that all that prep that goes in. Uh, and that's mostly him, uh, to be honest. But we talk about it all the time. And it's the same pre-season. Um, I think, you know, when we're looking at players, um, we have 
I mean, we look at loads of players gets bombarded by agents, and um, I think we 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 always say it's a, it's not a rule it's not like a rule we have but we, we don't sign anybody unless we're both 100 percent happy you know if, if one of us has got the slightest doubts then we don't go with it so hmm. um you know when we get when we do get players in um we have had a good uh a good chat about it for sure mm. i remember when you were doing the um when you're reaching out to me andreas and you're saying about the oh we signed so and so could we get press release out it all happened very early this summer um it, was that on your mind to get players in and get the get the signings confirmed early doors, or was it just was it just you know just good conversations having at early stages in the off season? It's just finding the the right fit, and uh, mm-hmm. you know if uh, both myself, Nick, and, and and Chris as well, like you know we feel positive about a player and we feel he fits into the system and you know uh, he could do really well for us, we we'll, we will go for it. Uh, sometimes this process you know, happens very early on and we're able to get a couple of the guys very early on this year. Um, I mean, uh, sometimes it happens a little bit later in the summer. Um, it, it just fluctuates kind of thing. I mean, there was one year, I think, uh, going into 17, 18, I think it was, where we just literally, I think, signed most of the roster in May and June. And <laughs> It was like, uh, you know, some, some people will say maybe uh, Andreas and Nick wanted to have a little bit of time off, but it, it's a, but, but it, it just it just happened. Uh, you know, uh, the right players, the right fit. Uh, we really like how uh, the team will be, and um, and and also it fit the budget as well, which is a, another important element. I keep on coming to it because it, it is you cannot have a, everything you like. You will just have to. Uh, kind of look at your budget and just make the best decision for for the team, basically, based on that. This is the Bristol Flyers podcast. Now, we've obviously got our team uh, this season so far. We've had the opening cup games happen. That's when we're recording this. I want to just hear a little bit of your uh, reflections on the cup games so far. How do you feel we've done as a team and uh, what are we looking to improve on moving forward into the regular season? Um I mean, the main the main thing is we have been extremely competitive through all the fixtures. And I mentioned, I referred to the the first 20 minutes of that London game. I think that was probably the only 20 minutes that we felt we were not competing to the level we would like to. Um, certainly, we started uh, the camp campaign with a big uh, win at Leicester. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of people were not expecting that. Um and and we're figuring things out, you know. Fi- finishing first of all, finishing four and four in that uh, group, uh, I think, uh, is a, a very good achievement. And really, the goal that we set was to make it to the to the quarterfinals, to to make it to the next round. That was the overall. It wasn't, you know, how many wins we can get or anything. The first goal was make sure we go through uh, to the next round of the cup. And and then the second thing was as part of this process is make sure we're improving as a team. And, and we felt we'd do that. We did that well. Uh, we competed. We had a very good fighting uh, mentality. Uh, even games that, you know, we went down, we will come back. And, and I think the two-game series against Sari was also very important at the end as well um, because it highlighted that we're still as a team. Uh, we're figuring things out and we have very good spells in the game, but sometimes we're, we're unable to close out. And it was great said to me to see in the last game against Sari that we were able to close out that game, even though I'm, making a big run uh, in the second half. Um, so so you can see the improvements and you can see the, the mindset of the team and the playing style. Um, but there's certainly areas of a game that we've got to improve on both ends of the court. And, and we've spent some time talking about that this week as well. Uh, and, and I think Nick will agree. Offensively, we just got to cut down on turnovers. I think that's that's the main thing that kind of stands out. We do a, good, a great job on the boards and uh, and I think we're sharing it reasonably well as well. Uh, but I think cutting down turnovers, I think, has to be uh, a thing. And, and defensively, I think, is just keep on working on the things that we're doing in terms of our positioning, not taking any time off, uh, being more consistent and not allowing teams to go on big runs and certainly locking in on people's personnel, which is going to be very important, uh, you know, in terms of the league that we play. You know, guys can get hot. There's a couple of guys that we're playing against uh, against Cheshire this week that can get hot. So we just got to make sure we're able to deal with those moments. Uh, but overall, 
I think it's it's been very positive. I mean, we've we've had a few injuries uh, through through those games, uh, and we're still carrying some injuries, so that has been a little bit difficult. But but having said that, I thought the team has coped very well with that as well because different guys have stepped up um, when when we had those injuries, and I think it's great. Also, you know, we refer to to the American players and we refer to some of the British players it's also to see great some of the younger guys as well, uh, how they're doing. I mean, I thought Jacob Pasquale really helped us in our last game against Sari and, and Corey has been, uh, even though he had a little bit of a, a gap uh, due to COVID where he had to isolate for a little bit kind of thing. He, he was great early on and, you know, like that game against Leicester away. And, and I think that has been very positive to see the whole squad progressing uh, as a team, but also individually as well. Mm. Are, these, are these cup games almost allows you to experiment with the squad a little bit and try out different lineups that you not necessarily would try if it was in the regular season? Yeah, that's something we talked with Nick um, and Chris about. Um, every every game we had slightly different starters. So I think we've uh, kind of tried to play around a little bit with, with those starting lineups. And, and I think it's good to have that fresh look every game. Don't have to always start with the same five. And certainly we don't feel we have a team that we have, okay, these are our starting five kind of thing, and these are the guys that come off the bench. I think we can have different based on who we're playing and, and how we want to play in a particular game. Um, but also during the games, we've played with bigger lineups, uh, playing with Malcolm and Zach together. Um, and then we've played also with smaller lineups, if you want to call it, with Josh uh, at the four spot. And, and I think that's kind of another element of our game. I think that flexibility to go from smaller lineups into bigger lineups. Um, uh, and I think that's pretty good that we are able to do that basically. And, and certainly that will help us because you've got to have so many different playing styles that you've got to go against during the season. And I think we have been able to experiment and play around uh, quite a lot during these uh, eight cup games. Nick, what have you learned about the team that you can take from these first eight games into the regular season now? Um. I don't. <laughs> I think the first and foremost thing is you, you. We haven't had any terrible surprises. I think the um, you know when you look at the players, you um, you have a sort of best case scenario, worst case scenario um, in your head. Um, you know, and I think that the players have been um, pretty much as we wanted from that point of view. Um, I think the, I think it's important for them the eight games, the eight games in the cup. It's really good. Bearing in mind the the four Americans, for example, three of them I think are. I've not played pro professionally at all. They've not played abroad, and Mike's only played about half a season. So it's really important for them to get <clears throat> get some pro experience. Really get used to playing in a pro league. Get used to the officiating. You know, get used to how the game's a bit different. Um, so it, it's really important for them. I I always say, you know, most seasons we have an, an American point guard, and nearly always they've. Um, it's it's the first season here, and I, I always say to him, it takes them at least six games to work the league out. Even the good ones, it takes six games to work the league out. So I think um, it, it's it's the eight game program is a nice length to for for the players to work the league out for us to have a look at the players and, and to work out where we are. So you know we can really sort of hit the ground running. Uh, hopefully, you know if everybody problem is everybody's banged up after eight games. I mean you say it, it's. I always laugh when people talk about start the season. It seems like we've been going forever. I mean, it's about 10 weeks old, isn't it now? And everybody's had time to get a little bit banged up. So it's um, it might as well be the middle of January is the, the start of the season, really. We're all feeling it. So, um, yeah. What's it been like just having fans back? Because, um, you know, the whole last year, we've had to do it without any fans. And then obviously the first game back, I know it was reduced capacity to start with. And then they've slowly been bringing uh, more and more fans back in. But I imagine that first game back was quite quite special. It, it funny, I, it's not the same. It's it's quiet out there. Um, I think um, it's getting better. I mean, obviously, we didn't. Have, we're not filling the place, but I think, and some of the um, some of the season ticket holders have said this that there's a lot of new people coming to games, and it, you haven't got that. Uh, it's almost like they don't quite know what to do first games. It's not like I it, the, the, we're having timeouts at the end of the game, and you can't hear Andreas when I'm standing next to him because the crowd are making so much noise. I mean, that's the way I remember it on you know, big nights from two, three years ago. We haven't quite got back to that yet, uh, but it's getting there. Um, it's, it's getting there. And it's just, it's just so nice to have people watching. It's just, you know, it really is. So is that a subtle call for you to tell the fans to get louder, basically, is it? Uh, it wasn't that subtle, was it? I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> 
We don't want to hear Andreas swearing at the players. You've got to bring the uh, bring the noise up a little bit in time now. So. Oh. Andreas, there are a few things as well. I've, you know, just having simple things back this year, like team meals, team socials. I imagine that alone makes a massive difference as well. Well, I touched upon it before. Uh, I mean, last year was such a difficult year for, and and certainly not having fans around was was one thing. And it's great to have fans back. And and but I think, uh, as you say, that social element, that interaction off the court. Um, I mean, yesterday we were at Pepineros having some pizza with the guys, you know, being able to have team breakfast at Village Hotel and some of the lunches as well. Uh, j- j- just being able to be around each other more. I think last year it was uh, due to the restrictions, you know, guys had to come to practice and, and then after practice, everyone had to disperse and go home, basically. And, and that, that has been very difficult. And, and, and the fans play a big part to it as well because, you know, and Nick, Nick touched upon it and stuff uh, previously when we had discussions about that, you know, after a game, you win or you lose, having the fans to interact with and, and speak to them after the game, which we're still not doing uh, at the moment. And hopefully we're going to get there and have those after game catch ups, which are very important. Um, I think, and the other thing is there was no, none of our youth teams training last year. The second men's team was not there. The women were not there. It, it just, we felt very isolated uh, as a group last year. I think it's fair to say that, Nick, right? It, it yeah. just felt, yeah. you know, you're talking about the community, you're talking about the program, but, you know, like you're going around, you're not seeing anyone really. Um, so so I think that, that, was, that was very difficult and, and certainly being back, to, to those type of things, the social interactions is huge for, for everyone in the team. Uh, it, it just feels uh, more regular, more normal kind of thing. Um, and, and, I, and I think, I think that, that, that has been also very important, especially with a new team, uh, a younger group of guys. Um, I think the one positive thing that we haven't mentioned so far is also that we have guys that have been part of our youth program. They've come through our academy. Um, you know, like you look at Jake, you look at Corey, they joined Josh uh, as guys that have come through our youth age groups all the way to the academy and playing now for the first team. And then you look at someone like Pasquale, who even though he wasn't in our academy program, he has played for our junior teams. And that has been also very important because these guys understand the program. Um, and and it has, it's just a nice mix of guys. You know, we're enjoying each other's company and stuff. And certainly those social elements help in that regard as well. This is the Bristol Flyers podcast. So we've touched on obviously a lot of the new things into the team this year. Obviously, brand new team. A few of the quite a lot of new things off the court as well. Andreas, obviously, um, I, I don't think we could really start without talking about uh, <laughs> you becoming a dog dad <laughs> with Ruby. <laughs> how are you? How are you? How are you? How are you, uh, how are you balancing the? How are you balancing the two commitments right now with coaching and, and looking after Ruby? Well, Ruby's amazing. I mean, she keeps myself and Ursula very, very busy. Uh, certainly, my the amount of steps have gone sky high uh, in terms of taking her out in, in the morning and a little bit of a lunchtime walk and then an evening walk. But it's also quite nice and relaxing because, you know, you can go out for like 30 minutes and, and you know, like get some fresh air. It's actually very positive. Uh, uh, we have ups and downs. Uh, you know, uh, we learn through this process. Um, I always enjoy looking at Nick's comments when we put a photo of Ruby on uh, social media <laughs> kind of thing, either having a haircut or, or anything else that is going on. Uh, but no, it, it, has, it has been great, actually. Uh, she, she, she's a fun girl. She's, she 12, she's 12 months now, so she's a year old uh, and uh, certainly keeps us entertained. You're putting your hands in your uh, your head in your hands there, Nick. Is that because he doesn't stop talking about the dog? Well, it's looking at all the puppy photos, isn't it? Really, that's yeah. The only good thing, there is there is one good thing. There's always that you know dreadful moment when you go on the uh, when you go on the away game. Um, I think it was when we went to London and and, and got beaten. You come in home and it's that it's in the bus. There's that you're looking at your watch. You're thinking, at what point is it going to be safe to have a conversation with Andreas? Because clearly nobody wants to talk to him at the moment because he's only sitting there fuming. And, but you now have that moment where he sort of comes out with the dog stuck with the puppy stories now, you know, and he's, he's, he's got the text from Ruby or whatever. And you think, all right, he's calmed down now. He can have a conversation. <laughs> from that point of view, it looks quite well. 
Can, can I just say, it's just the best feeling ever. Like, you know, when you come home after a practice or a game, it doesn't really matter what has happened. Uh, you know, Ruby so excited to, uh, to, to see me. So I think that's just a very calming effect straight away, that kind of thing. So you immediately <laughs> forget about everything. It's unconditional love. Uh, so, <laughs> and certainly some fun photos that my wife sends as well uh, on the way back as well. That helps that process. <laughs> there we go. After a loss, anything... The best way that to... don't speak to Andreas until he's seen photos of Ruby. That's the uh... <laughs> that's the moral of the story. <laughs> I mean, one of the other things, um, obviously, that um, are new into the team. Obviously, you you brought in Rich Clark as um, S and C coach. Mm-hmm. Um, how much of an impact has he made in the short amount of time he's been here so far? Oh, it has been great to have him on board. Um, he has a lot of expertise. And, and to have someone like himself working with our team uh, is going to be so beneficial uh, in, in the short run, but also in the long run as well. Um, uh, himself uh, and, and Craig Barden, our physio, they, they work very hard. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, uh, uh, about obviously the, the impact our coaching staff has, but, uh, you know, Craig and Rich, uh, these guys work really hard, uh, looking at our loading and just putting things in place to, to keep guys healthy through the course of the year, uh, that side of it. Um, and, and, you know, like um, we, we do not, the reality is a lot of people, you know, they think of us and they think we operate like perhaps like Bristol City do or, or Bristol Rugby. And the reality is, you know, it's not like that at all. Uh, we have uh, limited resources. Um, but what we do have is some very passionate people working really hard uh, to maximize what we have. And certainly having Rich on board um, and, and Craig really helps our team perform on the court. And, and I have to mention also Craig Reamer, who was our previous strength and conditioning coach. Um, you know, he was with us for a period of five years or so. And, and he did an awesome team um, and also work with the team and, and really helped our guys in a lot of ways and, and kept guys healthy and, and maximized their performance on the court. And, and, and what's great is with having someone like Rich, you know, you're always worried, you know, after four or five years of having such a good strength and conditioning program, you know, okay, you're going through the process and you're thinking we'll be able to get the right person. And, and the great thing with Rich is he, he has the expertise, he has the knowledge, and uh, it has been great to pick up from where we left off with Craig, basically, and, and that's really good. This is, don't forget as well, we got Gus, uh, Gus Atkins as uh, sort of full-time performance analysis um, coach this year, and that has got a, that is a performance analysis analysis coach. The guy who does the the tape for Andreas has got to be the worst job in English basketball because it's a thankless task. Um, you know, and Andreas is going to do the scout on Cheshire or whatever, whoever it is, you know. And, He'll tell them what to do, and Gus will spend ages putting all these clips together. And Andreas has got this kind of photographic memory on plays that he wants absolutely. He knows which plays he wants, you know. And Gus will present it to him. He said, "No, oh, I don't want that play because the guy's setting the screen half a meter away from where they should be normal." Well, if you put that one in for you, you should put this one. It's like crazy. Poor old Gus. Thankless task. He's doing a brilliant job there, and uh, he's, uh, he's he's finding it quite interesting working with Andreas. I think, but he, uh, He's, he, I think he's helped a lot, not least because he saves both of us an awful lot of time, um, and it, you know it makes the it makes the whole scout so much uh, so much better. I think. So shout out for him as well. A hundred percent, and just to add to what Nick says about Gus, I mean he's on an internship this year uh, from Bath University, um, and and uh, the displacement year for him is 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 valuable learning experience. But he's working really really hard, and and it's great to have that support because you know. Uh, we want to really, I mean, Nick talked about preparation. We want to be as prepared as, as we can be and certainly having that extra level of support there. And, and Gas has been through the program himself. He has been a, a youth player and he has been part of the academy. And, and it's great to see him in this role right now. And he's doing a great work. I mean, you know, like I always give him feedback and he takes it on. And, and every time he keeps on coming and being better and better. And his scouting reports are getting very, very good right now. So I don't even have to make a lot of changes now. It's just, you can go straight away into it, basically. Um, but it's great to have him on board as well, for sure. The fans are coming to the games and they're seeing the game and they want to be entertained which is part of it and and have you know a big battle on our hands but 
the way you're talking, like it's a professional team. Like we've got so many intricate different cogs as part of this bigger picture to make this whole thing go around. And 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 with those additions, like, do you feel the professionalism of the team like always going up and up all the time? Are you seeing that happen? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we we always say we're on a journey, right? Um, and 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 I think it, I'm touching upon budget because I mean, you know people don't see those things but you know we don't have the same resources as a football club or a rugby club that that's mm-hmm. that's a matter of fact and and the thing is it's not going to happen all overnight uh, and you look where we are right now kind of thing and when we started in the BBL and where we're in division one we always put things to improve the program on and off the court and and this is part of it the professionalism element uh, I think the one thing that we've always done is um, you know, and and uh, let, let, let me just talk about our team manager, Mike Edkins. Um, I think is maximize what we have. And we have people that really care and they put a lot more in and it doesn't equate to money they will be receiving. And in some cases, they will not be receiving anything as well. Uh, our volunteers have been amazing. Like game day will not run without our volunteers, you know, and, and not just game day in the BBL, game day over the years, basically when we're, in division two or division one kind of thing so so the thing with it is the professionalism irrespective of budget i feel the professionalism has been increasing year by year um, and and we operate in very high standards and and i think it comes down to the people you know it comes down to to the people that we have involved really and um, and the thing is it doesn't matter if we play in a bigger venue in the future um, and you know the budget gets increased. We always want to have these people with us because that has been the journey, and that's the family. And and you know we want to keep on pushing, and we want to keep on maintaining those high levels of professionalism that we have. And it comes down to the people that you have involved at the end of the day. So they, they determine uh, the standards that you operate in. I know we spoke about um, the work Mike and Gus and and Rich are doing. Um, you've also this year started working with. Um, with George and Jim in terms of the sports psychology side of stuff or off the court. We haven't really um, shouted about that too much. It's all been very much behind closed doors. I think we put the video out with um, with Jim and the sports vision stuff, but just talk us through kind of how how that came about and and what kind of work they're going to be doing with the with the first team this year. I think it's, a, it's all about marginal gains, you know, uh, and, and growing the program and, and getting the most out of our uh, – players and helping them improve so as part of this process you know i think sports ecology is 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 very important uh, i think uh, in the, it's 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 great that to work on the physical side of things but uh, i think the emotional uh, and mental health i think they're also very important factors really so i think uh, you know speaking with george and jim uh, this summer was great and and jim um, spend some time with us with the sports uh, vision uh, training program, uh, which helps dynamic uh, um, viewing. Um, so, you know, and vision of the players. And, and again, it's about that, those small differences uh, that can have a lot of high gains basically for us. So, um, and, and George uh, working with the team, working with myself and, and exploring different areas. Like one of the things we want to do at the moment is like imagery. So we want to spend a little bit of time and do maybe a group session on imagery. But again, it's just adding more to the program uh, to, to help our athletes and maximize our performance on the court. And that's what it is about. So, so we covered the, um, the, the new stuff into the team this year. Obviously, we talk, spoke about reflected on the cup games so far. Um, looking ahead now to, to regular season, have you guys got goals and ambitions and targets set out for where you guys want to finish or, 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 or who you'd like to match up with in the playoffs or, or, or is it way too early to be talking about that kind of stuff? I think it's too early, really. You know, um, we just want to keep on getting better. Um, I, think, I think that's got to be important. Um, every week, uh, every month, I know it sounds very cliche kind of thing, but you want to, to keep on getting better as a basketball team. And certainly if we can make a, a, a run in the cup and, and try to finish up, up as high in the league table as possible, uh, would be great. And, you know, the, the goal is always, can we get in, in high? I mean, you know, like last year we finished eighth. Uh, can we get the highest 
finish that we can. Our highest finish before has been sixth. So can we get above that? Um, so that's always kind of overall as a goal. But but the most important thing is, you you know, like teams will go through changes and you see some rosters changing already kind of thing. Um, what you want to do is improving and be ready uh, and be at your best at the right time of the season. I think that that's what is important. We want to win every game. And that's kind of the mentality that we're going with. Um, but at the same time, there is a bigger process where we want to keep on improving as a group. And the reality is sometimes you've got to miss that. Sometimes you've got to make that. Uh, you, you, you know, Nick talked about it. The Leicester game, we, we beat them. But if Connor Washington had made that shot at the end, uh, we would have lost that game kind of thing. So uh, I don't. when it's a close game, a lot of different things can happen. But what we want to do is our performance on the court, uh, are we maximizing what we have? And the reality is you do need a little bit of luck and you do need some sets to go in and maybe some sets not to go in. Um, but but we just want to keep on getting better. I think that that's kind of our focus as a team. And and certainly if we can make a cup run and, and you know, go into playoffs with momentum and, and kind of make some noise, that would be great as well. I think it's... Um... You can't. You don't know what the other team's going to be like, even after the cup run at the moment. I think you look at it, there's different ways of doing it. One is we've had, I think, one season where we finished above 50%. So, you know, straight away you want to think, let's get above 50% and then stay there. Um, another way to look at it is do we play everybody three times. It's 27 games. You break it into those three groups of nine. Where, do, you know, you play the first nine games, try and, you know, get to over 50 50 there. And then you start looking at the league table and think, what's realistic? Where do we want to go? What are we aiming at? Most of the season we've played, there's been something on the last game of the season. You know, you play 30 games and get to the end of the season and you still need to win the last game either to get in the playoffs or get a home advantage in the playoffs or get to play the team or whatever it is. It comes down to the last game. So every game is important. It's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. Every single game is important, especially with the head-to-heads the way they are because it's three games now, you know, and there'll be a lot of head-to-head games in there. So it, it, it never stops. Um, you know, the, the pressure to win the games doesn't stop. And they're no easy games either. I mean, like in the BBL, they're no easy games. I mean, you, you look at all the teams and I know Plymouth, okay, you, you look at our cup record, but they've just signed Kofi Josephs and Royal Graham. And, and if they get the sponsorship license, they, they will be probably adding some American players, I suppose, at some point as well. Um, but you look at all the teams, Sarri, you know, they, they're solid this year and they're going to be adding players as well uh, to the roster. And, and you're looking around, <laughs> there are no easy games. Every game is a, is a tough one out there. So um, uh, and to just to add to the point what Nick is doing, it's just too early to talk. We just want to keep on improving and, uh, you know, certainly win as many as we can. Um, but just control the factors that we can control to win those games. And, you know, you, sometimes guys will just make sats and, and, and that's the game, basically. And hopefully we're going to be the team that makes the sats when, when it matters the most. This is the Bristol Flyers podcast. Just to slow, slowly start to wrap things up before we get to the the mailbag, the last thing I did want to cover was obviously Sky Games back this year. They've been huge for everyone during lockdown to just, you know, to watch British basketball, to put it out there on the stage. Um, did you guys get a chance to sort of um, watch the first game this year? Obviously, it's so good for, for British basketball to be back on on Sky Sports again this year. I think the, the Sky Sports coverage is great. I, I mean, I watched the, the Leicester-Newcastle game. I, I'm, I wasn't certain about Drew Lasker's bow tie, uh, but... Uh, but other than that, I, th- I thought the coverage was great. I mean, what Sky Sports are doing in Bar 16 and just just the, the exposure, uh, I think it's great for our league. Our league deserves that. There's so much talent in the league. I think our league is so underrated. Um, and you can see it right now with the success that London have in Europe. Um, and, and I think it's great to have them um, giving the right type of exposure in our league and, and hopefully more, more to come from there. And the timing is perfect. The national team, the men national team being in the Eurobasket this summer, um, I think just everything is lined up right now to keep on pushing our league and the quality across the league is, is great. And certainly having uh, our games and Sky Sports is, is, is what this league needs. Yeah, I think, that, I think the coverage is really good. They've got a good package there and hopefully the games they picked you know, for, the, uh, for the Friday night games will 
uh, or turn out to be the right games and they get some good close exciting ones but I think the uh, I think the coverage is excellent really good yeah well Flyers are going to be on Sky Sports on uh, November 16th at uh, the November 19th even uh, against Glasgow Rocks the big question is Andreas we've seen you wear the suit on Sky Sports before we've seen you wear the polo on Sky Sports before what is Coach K and Nick Burns going to be wearing uh, come November 19th up at the Emirates Arena well, hopefully we can even wear the same color. I mean, against Sari, we were not even wearing the same color. He had I white. Got I, had blue, blue. I haven't got a blue top. Nobody's <laughs> given me a blue top. <laughs> You've got a blue polo set. That's uh, last year's. I'm not wearing last year's rubbish. You've got blue <laughs> polo <set. laughs> So, but uh, who knows? I'll keep them guessing, Joe. You know, sometimes the suit will come out. Sometimes it might not come out. You know, uh, we just see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff all right let's get to the uh the mailbag to start to wrap things up we put out on social media uh to fans to send their questions in to you guys we picked a few out um i'm gonna go through some of the best sam do you want to go through the the first one have you got the first one yeah okay so we got an interesting one here actually from tion ross who on instagram asked why don't the teams ever stay together and i imagine that's from season to season yeah, I think uh, we, I mean we almost kind of covered that in the podcast, really, didn't we? In terms of um, in terms of flyers, but I guess um, you know, it's just Nick. It, I think as a as a here's a here's a basic scenario. Most of the teams, apart from the big three, are working on pretty limited budgets, and therefore you need to get some players that don't cost a lot of money on your. If you if you've got a team, your typical thing might be you've got eight pros, eight guys you're going to pay. Some of those guys, you, you're going to be looking for the lower end of the, the pay scale. And and, very, and you might take a risk on a player. And there's loads of those guys this year because you've got a lot of guys didn't play last year because of COVID. You've got guys that might have had injuries. You've got this. So you'll find the team, the teams will all have in there some guys that are, that are good players that are really hungry to play, but they're playing on a fairly low salary. If they have a good season next year, they're going to be able to get double the money somewhere else. And, yeah. and you're going to have to go back and look for somebody else that's on that low budget. So, you know, a lot of the time, if you've got a play, particularly if you've got a rookie and they do well, they're going to demand in a bigger salary next year. So therefore, they're all, they might go somewhere else to get it. So you're going to get that. Sometimes people just want to change. Sometimes, you know, the pros, the nature of the contracts, because they're used to being on one-year contracts, they will go, you know, they will move around clubs and they might want to go to different countries. So there's all sorts of reasons why players will want to move regardless of whether you want to keep them or not. Um, so it, it, it is very hard to keep the same squad together on the same budget. Let's put it that way. Got another question here from Richard on Twitter. Uh, hasn't given a surname, but he wants to know uh, when's Nick's cooking show coming back? <laughs> well, I think I, I did in the, in the unlikely event that we get another lockdown and people are so incredulously bored with Joe Wicks that they tune into me. Um, I think it's a great mistake for people to resurrect these things. You know, I think when you get rock bands trying to come back or, you know, footballers trying to come back at the age of 36 to their teams or whatever, and do it, it, it doesn't work. So in the unlikely event that it happens, I think I would have to find something else to do. Um, you know, maybe I could do sort of, um, maybe I could do sort of painting. I could do a painting of the week, couldn't I? I could do, you know, still life one week and, and then maybe an abstract the next week, landscape the week. It could be, you know, canvas with coach nick couldn't it i, I wonder if maybe it'd be something like that I don't know. did nick did nick say just like he put himself in the same category with a rock band for a cooking show and, and cristiano <laughs> ronaldo as well cristiano ronaldo <laughs> why why are you um having a go at joe wicks i based my whole look on him <laughs> <laughs> i think uh i think the i think coach nick's cooking could make quite a good little series on tiktok the point, if you remember this, Joe, people won't know this, that the original idea here is I said, I did one for John. I said, this would be really good in lockdown. People would board for all the players. Do we have a different player each week? Do one. You know, you could have imagined, couldn't you? Panos in the kitchen would have been wonderful, but no, none of the other players did it. So it, it stuck with me doing it every week. So, okay, then can you do another one? It was tough asking some of those guys to to get involved. I don't think many of them really fancied it. Um, but I mean, if when Nick's sending through fire content like that, you just can't say no, can you? When the bar is so high, Joe, like you know, <laughs> no one wants to really to try to compete against that. So. <laughs> oh, that's it. That's it. Um, I want a quick answer for this one. But Amy Atkinson on Twitter wants to know what has been your most challenging game to coach in your career. It's a good question. 
I mean, uh, with the club or the, the national team. I mean, there's a few, a few kind of different ways to say it. Um, I mean, there's been a few. There's been a few. There. It's very difficult to pinpoint one. Um, and, and, and the thing with challenging is, is it a game that we won and it was challenging or it was a game that we lost and it was challenging? Um, I, I, think, I think, you know, there's always those games that you look back and you're going like, oh, what could have done better kind of thing? What we could have done better as a team? Um, you know, and, and I suppose the most recent one of that um, it could have been, you know, something like the cup final, um, uh, you know, and, and certainly we wanted to bring that cup back to Bristol, but hopefully we're going to have an opportunity in the future to be back there again, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, but it's just difficult to pinpoint one particular game um, for, for me um, because there's been so many. I mean, Nick and I have coached for the Flyers like over 16 years worth of games. So I think uh, th there's, there's been a few. Uh, maybe Nick has, has had a little bit more time quickly to think of one. But. Well, it, I think it's, it's, it comes back to that point about preparation. I think you've done your prep right. I mean, from my little bit of experience of doing it when you were away with the Commonwealth team, you've done your, your prep right. The game's okay because you kind of know what you're doing. You, you can, you know, your phrase, Andreas, control what you can control. I think they probably... The, 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 the worst games to coach are the ones you're expected to win. And you're a bit worried the players are a bit complacent, maybe, and the, game, and the games are closer, you know, and you, you and that's, that's where you feel a bit of pressure and things are getting a little bit out of your control. They could, sometimes those games can be a bit difficult. We had a lot of those games in Div 1, didn't we, where we were you hoping to win the league and you can't really afford to lose any. And there's a bit more pressure on them, I think. Um, those, games can be quite, uh, those games can be quite tough. Um, but I think the other thing, the other thing I'm aware of, I, this sounds crazy that I only became aware of this when I when I was coached the game for those five games. You are totally dependent on what the players on court do. You know, I mean, if they make shots, Marcus made a great shot to, you know, win the, the Surrey game last weekend was a classic. Marcus made the big shot to go ahead by three. And then McLemore comes down, he hadn't stepped on the line, the game would have gone to overtime. You know, that's not coaching, that's players. And players just doing their stuff. And players make great plays players miss shots and when it comes down to it you know that, that's what it comes down to you have no control over it whatsoever and that sort of uh, I mean it makes it it makes it better and worse for the coach I think um, it, it makes it worse because it's totally out of your control but you can't be blaming yourself necessarily as well it's it's you know that's just the way it is it's not a very good answer to that I know but um, we've probably got time for probably two more questions here um one question here from Matilda Duke on Instagram. She asks, uh, what's the best play that you've seen? What's the best play? Yeah, I guess I'll tell you what. Um, there was one that stands out for me. Um, I, I, you shared it on Twitter the other week. It was the opening jump ball where um, you had Raf set a back screen for Malcolm off the tip against Surrey at home and he gets that dunk. I think you tagged, um, was it... Um, is it Paolo? Yeah, for the assistant from... coach from Leicester Riders. Yeah, because uh, he had served it. He had served uh, the, the, the play. Like, I, I cannot take credit for it. Uh, I mean, first of all, Raf kind of set the back screen and the guy's executing on the court. But also, it was a play that a EuroLeague team ran. And, uh, you know, like the, the Leicester coach had put it on Twitter kind of thing and he commented or whatever. So I thought, like, you know, we are. We actually did think about running it against them when we played them. And he did look at me just at the start of the game, and he was like, "Are they going to run it against us?" Because the lineup was exactly the same. Um, but but that was a that was a great play. I mean, and certainly we we got the score out of the sorry kind of thing. So and 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 I think it was Algiris off the top of my head, Gary Connors that ran that play, and, and they got the score. So that's a good one to to start the game. Really, now we probably tipped all the teams, so they're they're all going to be like ready for that. Well, someone is going it's one to of those it. ones you can only run once in a season and that's so, it. So, well, actually, we tried to run it a few times so far and we scored one side of it, but probably <laughs> probably someone is going to run it against us and we're just going to be going like this now kind of thing. So next game, Cheshire run it against us, they get a score and we'll just be like, oh, my God, they're running at the play that we ran. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so we've got time for one last question, which is a great question. And it's from Kaiham123 on Instagram, who wants to know, how do I get into the basketball academy? Very good question. Uh, just reach out to Chris Bourne, uh, chris.bourne at sgs.co.ac.uk. Uh, uh, reach out to him if you've played basketball before. Um, you can apply to do a, 
the college course uh, at the BTEC or A levels, and and the coaches run tryouts through the course of the year. So if you reach out to uh, to Chris, he'll be able to talk you through the process. But also you've got to be able to combine it with the academic side of things uh, if it's a BTEC or A level uh, as well. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. I think that's a great place to to wrap things up. Andreas, Nick, thanks a lot for joining us on the podcast. Best of luck for the season ahead. 